My topic tonight, I always try to come up with something new every time, uh, microdosing in the weight room. Can you do a lot more with a lot less? Great question, right? We're not talking about that. I know a lot of people think, well, great, we, get, we can afford lots of those dumbbells for school and we can go through and everyone can have dumbbells and we can make it work. That's not what I'm referring to. Uh, and I'm going to take you on my journey here as to how this went. So I always have some kind of journey to get to these points. And so I'm blaming this one again on Ken Clark. If you don't know Ken, Ken spoke here in the summertime and he'll be speaking in Tampa next week with us. But he is a, one of the rare people that is a researcher and a coach. He is a biomechanist professor at Westminster in Philadelphia. And he coaches their track and trains the girls' soccer team. So he is their sprint coach. He worked with Peter Wayand all those years and did all the research with Peter Wayand, was his assistant at SMU. So he's got this great mind and this great background. And we talk a lot because we, we get ideas from each other. And this was after the last TFC and we were talking about you know, what we were working on and where we're going. And he started talking about some research that he started doing, which I'm not supposed to talk about, but he's not here, so no, he'll never know. Uh, but he is doing something, again, we're all trying to figure out how you can make people run faster. That's why we're all here, and that's kind of the journey we're all on. And he took a bunch of athletes from all walks of life. Gymnasts, he, I think he had a, a 4'11 gymnast and a 6'10 basketball player, and everyone in between. He even had some guys that ran 10'3", 10'4 type stuff. And so he's trying to figure out what are the things that they all share in common. And so the things that he found was, so far, not researched, not finished, but what he thought or posited or posited or whatever you say in science, uh, it's going to be the ability that your legs split when you're in the air and the velocity that that swing leg comes down with. That's what he thought. Which is kind of interesting because it goes against Peter Wayne's original research that said the legs changing really don't mean much. And Peter Wayne even came back and said, yeah, you're right, that's what it is. And so if you're looking at it from you know, the Franz Bosch world, he calls it whip from the hip, the ability for that leg to come down and slam down. Or it's speed of repositioning, how fast you can make one leg go from here to here and switch sides. So that's got my brain thinking, which is never a good thing because it usually costs money, which my wife loves. And so I thought, well, I do all this overspeed stuff. And this is from the research that we did uh, two years ago, two summers ago, which has just got accepted and will be published here in the next couple months in Journal of Strength and Conditioning. So for a guy who had one science class in college, I am a published researcher. <laughs> who knew? So what I thought was this. What if I pulled you really fast, and I like to go over fast over mini hurdles, that way I, I can measure your stride and, and see how, make sure your legs are going at a certain speed, and I put weight on your legs. Because thinking that, well, if I'm going super fast, now it's slightly weighted, maybe that's going to create a different change in the body, and I've got to pull through faster and use my muscles in an appropriate speed and the appropriate muscles for that movement. That was my mind, that was my, what my brain was doing. At the same time, this is gonna drive me nuts. It's gonna be like old school. Remember the film strips in elementary school? It's the beep and it goes, there we go. I was also talking to Hank Krajenhoff and he's a sprint coach in uh, the Netherlands and he bounces all over the world and he's got, he's probably one of the best sprint coaches ever. He's got lots of world champions. Uh, especially from a place where you shouldn't have great sprinters in the Netherlands because there's nowhere to run. But he sent me this picture because I was asking, what are you doing that's new? And this is all I get. And I said, well, what is going on there? It's a girl running because he went back, he retired from coaching, came back because of this girl. And so he sent me that picture. So now I'm thinking, what is, what is unique about what she's got going on there and Maybe it's some of the weighted vests, this uh, wearables. And sure enough, after zooming in and figuring some things out, she has on these exogen clothes. Now I'm not selling these things. They're, I'm not, they're expensive and all that. I'm just kind of taking you where I was, how I got here. Um, 
And so what these are is they are very, very tight fitting clothes and you have these, and it looks kind of like he's Venom or Spider-Man or something, but these weights that are two to 300 grams that you put on body parts. So when you go to move, you actually have a slight resistance to your movement. I thought, well, those are kind of cool. Maybe I should buy some and see what they're all about. So I started doing research into it, and it's not that well set up. You know, it's uh, kind of a hard to find website. The website name really didn't match the, the clothes and all that. And so I'm starting to do research, and I found out that Great Britain used them quite a bit. And if we know anything about Great Britain from last year, the men won the world championship in the four by one, and the women were second. How many people remember that? Yeah, nobody watches in non-Olympic years. You have to actually do research, and it's like the third page in where you find this stuff. I think Bolt got hurt, didn't he? Isn't, isn't this the race in the four by one where he pulls up, and he said, that's it, I'm done, I'm going to go play soccer? And that didn't go well, did it? So I'm finding out that they, that's what they use quite a bit and extensively to the point where they bought up the entire shipment that he had coming out. So I knew something was up. And then I thought back to time, go back in time, because I've been looking at this stuff for a long time. How many people remember the Kolka thigh trainers? Anyone? Just two of us? Three of us? Four? The guy was from around here. I think it was a Don Beebe guy. Worked with Don Beebe. Uh, you put on these sleeves, and you put on the belt, and you put in these weights into these sleeves, and you run. And it's a great idea, but when you run, these things are bouncing around, and they're bouncing kind of close to some things. That's not so fun. And so they never really took off. But even though that all is true, the research about weighted limbs and, re and uh, exercising with that have been around since the 70s. It's just nobody really had the technology to make it work better. And we're going to look at, in a second, why that didn't work so great. So why did I drink the Kool-Aid? Science. So I, I want to thank Mike Kennedy over there. I train Mike's son and he comes on Sundays and every Sunday it was a physics lesson as to why this stuff should work and we looked at equations and now instead of having records up on my board everywhere there are physics equations that I still really don't get. I'm just going to pretend like I get them. But it, I learned a lot. So let's look at weightlifting here and what it's supposed to do and what the, the tradition is. Traditional reasons why we lift weights for athletic development, improve force capability to push harder on the ground. That's what the original research came from back when they started lifting weights back in the 50s and 60s. That's what they thought. To build internal force capability to have athletes overcome large external force, and that kind of comes from the football world where linemen have to push other linemen. Uh, my problem is this, we also push on the bar, and how many people have seen the kids in the squat rack where it looks like they're pressing more against the bar than they're pushing against the floor? Especially once your back gets into this position here, it's not so great, is it? Because now they're pressing into the bar to try and stand up and save their life, rather than using their hips to come through. Here's the interesting thing, and there's research out there about this. The problem that research is mixed with regards to improvement in weight room numbers and carrying over the track. For every one piece of research that shows that there is positive carryover, there's one and a half that shows that it isn't the case. And I know they like to hide the one and a half percent, but it's there. In fact, someone just did a, one of those cumulative ones and looked at all of it and was like, wow, this is a little, a little scary. So the question is, is there carryover or transfer training? Anatoly Bondarchuk talks about that. That's kind of what his big thing is. And I'm going to throw this in there. And this is some, how many people know triphasic or do triphasic training? This is why triphasic is different. And we're going to come back to it again. But... The goal, of tri the goal of triphasic is to change muscle tissue. That's why we do isometrics and eccentrics. And we're trying to create a hormonal response, which is why you have the, the extended holds. And that's why, again, why we have the emphasis on isometric and eccentric. But we're going to come back to that in a second. This thing's killing me. All right, here you go. 
we are looking at the difference between weight room and a sprint. And some of this stuff I'm sure you've seen before. For example, exercise orientation. Most of our weight room stuff is bilateral, meaning we've got two feet on the ground and we're pushing on something. Even when you're doing a leg extension, you've, sometimes you've got two legs in there. All sprinting is unilateral. You're always on one leg. If you're on two legs, you're not going anywhere. Force of orientation. Again, this is something that's been a hot topic. Uh, the J.B. Morin group just came out with a paper this week about this. Uh, force orientation is vertical in the weight room. And sprinting, accelerating, it's horizontal. And even then, you know, there's some question as to how much vertical there is. We know that with the Peter Wayne stuff, there is vertical force. Range of motion specif specificity. Uh, acyclic, meaning you're pressing one way. Sprinting is cyclic. Contraction type, most of what you do in the weight room is slow twitch muscle fiber, even if you say I'm pressing really hard on the bar and you're hoping that it's going to invert, it's probably not. And sprinting itself, fast twitch. Planes of motion, uniplanar, you're pressing one way. How many people love the hammer strength machine, especially when you're an old guy like me and you go to the weight room? There's no variation, you just press and it moves and I'm working out. Whereas when we're running, there's all kinds of multiplanar stuff. You have all your three different realms. Here's where it gets interesting. Muscle coordination. In the weight room, it is intermuscular. And we're, I'm going to go over these definitions because really the one thing, if you walk away tonight, you're going to see a bigger picture of how to train, regardless of all the fancy stuff I'm going to show you. Intermuscular, well, well, I'll show you the definition in a second. Muscle coordination for sprinting is intramuscular and other things. So there's many things that go into a sprint. Movement variability, like the hammer strength machine, is limited. Variability when you sprint. Who knows what's going to happen? You step funny one time, things may not come out very well. Here's where we're going to get into the physics stuff. Rotational inertia in weightlifting, there's none. You don't have to know physics, you know, just press. Uh, in sprinting, it's high because you have limbs that move just like with the angular velocity in the weight room, there's minimal. But in sprinting, it's high. And this is one of the things we're going to look at here is we're not developing these things here that are very important when you sprint. Body mass projection is always decelerating. Think about that, and that's like this bar speed at the end. You're decelerating. To save yourself when you're squatting with the bar on your back, 300, 400, 500, 200 pounds, 100 pounds, you've got to slow that bar down or else it's going to come off your back and land funny and may kill you. Your body knows that. So at the back half of your lift, you're always decelerating. That's why Louis Simmons put the chains on the bar. It's trying to get, force you to push through that last part. So in the, does that make sense to everyone? Yeah? But we're always projecting our body out. And I think this is one of the big jumps that we have in the weight room. We're trying to do things in the weight room and we're not making that... Like the kid who squats 500 pounds doesn't always get out of the blocks very well. You know, maybe because when he's training, he's got 500 pounds on his back, he's got to slow that bar down. But when we're coming out of the hole, you have to accelerate. You have to project your mass. And in the weight room, we're not doing that. So we're going to look at this stuff. And so we're going to base this on Bosch's multi-layer model of specificity. I know that's a mouthful. But here's all the things that have to take place when we play. And I stole this right out of his second book. Ready for this? Here we go. Intention. You know, whether you're running for something, you're getting chased by something, your intention in sport is you've got something you've got to do. You've got to have a target. And I think that's one thing that's unique in his training and, and even uh, rank, published, record, you know, the timing. You've got a target. Kids have a target. But when you put them in the weight room or even just go out and run repeat 200s and stuff like that, they don't have a target. And if you go back to his model here, that is the base of everything that we do is that target. So how can we carry that over? You need to have targets. Whatever your, whatever your drills are, whatever you're doing, there needs to be a target. Sometimes when people do drills, and I'm guilty of it too, 
you go out and you just do drills to do drills. They have no intention. There's no target. There's nothing that they're aiming for. They're doing the drills because you asked them to do it. There's no intrinsic motivation to do those drills. And if you go by this, which I agree with, there has to be that intention. There's got to be that target for you to shoot for. How many people don't remember Gary Larson's Far Side? Too bad. Environmental monitoring. He put a big cat on there and everyone loves it. Remember last year Carl Lewis put the picture of what he had a tiger up and said it was a cheetah? <laughs> Never forget. How do you blow that one? Especially in front of a bunch of teachers, it's the first thing they're going to look for is errors on your PowerPoint slide. So environmental monitoring. If we go back to the thing, this is an outer core one. Oh, come on. The blue shell on the outside. This is your body's ability to monitor everything that's going on. For example, 90% of what your brain does is picking up your peripheral vision and, and navigating you through to make sure you don't get hurt, you don't run into things, you avoid danger, or you're hunting that thing. Remember the old stuff where they said, well, we only use 10% of the brains. If we use the other 90%, maybe we'll be superhuman and that's how we get superpower people? That's not true. That 90% is navigating. It's this environmental monitoring of what's going on. And the reason why I have a cheetah up here, and if you don't think that's a real deal, their vestibular system is greatly different than every other animal on the planet, except for maybe some other animals that run really fast, which includes their hearing, their vision, the sockets are different, because he has to run at 65, 75 miles an hour and pick up all the stuff that's coming at him while he's after his target and not fall, because if he falls, there's a hyena or something that's always watching what he's doing, and they're going to try and eat him or steal his prey. Which kind of brings you to the thing about vertical jumping. If you, if you want to look at it from a person's standpoint, how many people have seen the person that jumps really high for the first time and they don't know how to land? You know, they jump up and they're kind of confused, and they're like, ah, and they kind of land funny, and they fall off the side. It's probably because they don't have the sense of what happens when they go that half inch or inch higher. And that's one of the reasons why I like overspeed training is because what if, and this is just a what if, nobody's ever proven this, what if you're running super fast and your body says this is too fast, shut it down, and you shut down. And sometimes it's this shut down. How many people have skied before and you know you're going a little too fast, you go, oh, this isn't good, and you start squatting down and maybe you'll even fall over to your side or instant snowplow. Your body instantly knows you're going too fast and it's going to do things to slow you down. So that's environmental monitoring. And, that's, and I, when I saw this, because one of my favorite things, I know this is nerding out, I really love a comparative biology with animals. And cheetahs, you know, they're, they're cool. So I thought that was really fascinating. And that's why they have this complex system that's different from most other animals. In fact, what this guy did is he went back in time and he found old cheetahs, not like 20 years old, but like from thousands of years ago and followed the lineage back and when they didn't run quite as fast and showed how their vestibular system changed as they ran faster and faster. It's kind of cool, huh? So that's environmental monitoring. That's the thing. Proprioception. Now unfortunately, this is what we think of proprioception. We're going to balance on things, we're going to stand on things, we're going to do one of these things on the upside down bozu ball type thing. I think that all that stuff isn't fast enough for what happens when we run and sprint and play sports. So I'm not sure if there's a carryover. But yet it is one of the shells and that goes along with environmental monitoring. So you recognize what's going on and you see that there's going to be a rock there and your body's going to stiffen up really fast or give a little bit to get ready for that. In fact, if you go back to 1994, Carmelo Bosco did a really cool piece of research uh, looking at floor surfaces and how your body responds to all the different floor surfaces, which goes along with this. So I don't know if this, I mean, if it's fun, I mean, it's fun to watch people fall, make a great YouTube clip type thing. But I don't know how much carryover that has just because in the real world, you, you're lacking, first of all, that environmental monitoring. And it's too slow. It's just too slow. So this one is the outside ring. 
And what they're looking at here, what we're trying to see here, and the question is, can a big bench presser always throw a shot? How many people have seen the kid who's got the big bench press? And you say, man, that's 60 feet right there. There's eight points in the state meet. And you go to throw, and it's like, 38? Really? It's it? Yeah, coach, that's all I got. Try again. How about practice a little bit? 38.5. Oh, yeah. Hey, go back to the weight room. You're not scoring anything. Causing the question, the outside aspect of specificity. When you have those big guys, and we build all that muscle, when you change it a little bit, you only get 75% return on that. That's an that's Anatoly Bondarchuk proven thing. The idea is because you, don't, you aren't used to that movement or your body's not sure what to do with all that extra mass, that you'll shut yourself down because you know you're going to get hurt. And so strength is really dependent on coordination. So if you don't have that coordination aspect into your weight room or any of your training things, you're going to limit the amount of carryover that you have, whether it's in the weight room or even your drills. All right, so here's the big stuff. Intramuscular firing. This is what we do in the weight room. And it's part of the equation. It's in the ball. It's one of those things, and I do it. You know, I do triphasic stuff. You improve muscle unit, motor unit recruitment. You try to improve your firing frequency, which we're going to look at here at the end, and your reflex activity. Sometimes it's just your traditional weight room stuff. But that's only one part of the ball, and I think with most people's programs, I'm going to go back here real quick. That one part of the ball is their entire ball, especially traditional football weightlifting programs. We're in the weight room again. What are we doing tomorrow, coach? We're in the weight room again. What are we doing today? Same. <laughs> Why? Because that's how we always do it. Remember that 82 team? Yeah. That was it. <laughs> Same thing. We lose our ability to use our body. Charles Poliquin talked about it. We're training muscles and not movements. He died this year, right? Yep. He had a long family history of heart problems. Mel Siff, he's dead too. Strength needs to be developed in context of speed. You have to keep it within 10% change of the speed of the limbs. And again, these guys were, with super training, looking at the basis of things, and it's still kind of the Bible of, of training. So it's different as this. It's intermuscular coordination. And I got this from Comey's book. A further way to increase power results from better intermuscular coordination. Intermuscular coordination describes the ability of all muscles involved in a movement, agonist, antagonist, synergist, to cooperate wholly with respect to the aim of the movement. Improvement of power of development of this type is also movement specific and therefore not transferable to another movement. The specific strength training and training practice strives mainly to optimization of intermuscular coordination. So in sprinting, it excites all these reflexes that we kind of blow off in the weight room and we only get to when we actually go to sprint. So whether it's your cross crawl pattern, your stumble reflex, uh, all the different reflexes that happen in your foot or you hope to happen in your foot, um, that's what we're missing when we're doing all this stuff. So ready? I'm going to take you on my tangent here. This is a planned tangent. This is my next journey, which I'm not even close to figuring out, but I'm hoping for help from some of you. But it's all going to tie in here. This thing haunts me. I don't know who put this up. I think it's Graham Morris. I accuse him of it, and he denies it. But it's true. In traditional weightlifting, or even what you're doing now, how much of this... I mean, does anyone disagree with those two statements? How much of this do we do? None, right? 
I mean, sprinting, but there's some stuff that, we're, that needs to be changed to actually get faster. So I st started researching on this stuff because my goal is this. This is what I found out. Now, I may, I'm probably wrong, I don't know. But I've got the equipment to prove it. And by the way, Cal, who's not here tonight, someone gave Cal, I think, almost a million dollars to build the ultimate weight room on the planet. And so Cal is backing all this stuff up with the hundreds of thousands of dollars of stuff that he bought. And he did such a good job, the guy came back and said, oh yeah, I'm going to give you more money now because this looks so good. Doesn't know what it is, but everything that you see that's really cool, that's really expensive, you think, boy, I wish I could see that one day. Cal has right now. To the point where researchers are coming in to come to Cal's place and just to use his stuff. Anyway. Influence of maximal muscle strength and intrinsic muscle contractile properties on contractile rate of force development. Because what I'm looking at here is how to get out of the hole. That zero step. How do you improve the zero step? And what I've found with my 1080 is that for some people, and I know this is going to sound crazy, between someone who's average and really good, there's as much as two tenths of a second of a difference to get to that first step. So before anyone hits the ground, before that foot hits the ground, someone's going to win by two tenths of a second. And if you go back to the research from a couple years ago with J.B. Morin, that's what he's talking about, that zero step, where he said the biggest difference between sprinters from 10-1 or 10 flat to 10-6 was that zero step. So my thought is, because you know me, I'm always losing by a tenth or two or whatever, if I could get that tenth or two back, before the race, just as the race goes, I think we'll be better off. So, this is what they found. When your contraction time is 250 milliseconds, cor correlated 250 seconds, milliseconds or more, it's going to be weightlifting. It's going to be something that's conscious. And it has no carryover into that pop out of the hole. The shorter times are all twitch and slack functions. And this summer I had a cool opportunity. Uh, sometimes I go down to Jacksonville and I get to do stuff with the Jaguars. And that I was in for rookie camp. And I watch and then they ask me questions, what I think in that. And so this was kind of wild because it was kind of like uh, hard knocks. Where here's all these rookies lined up. First round draft pick. And guys that, you know, free agents type stuff, trick guys that are trying to make the team. And they're doing starts and stuff like that. And to a T, you could tell by who got off the line faster and where they were drafted. To a T. I could tell them, that was your second round, there's your fastest guy right there, boom, 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 boom. It was noticeable in the NFL about how this, especially this kid from Alabama. I know they suck this year, but uh, safety, played safety at Alabama. And the wide receiver from LSU. Man, they covered this much in a blank. And these other guys, guy from USC, not so bad. Another guy from, you know, Wisconsin, you know, yeah, not quite the same. And that's what got me thinking here that there's got to be something here. So, on my 1080, I started measuring it. Here's the time and your speed between no load and a heavy load. Heavy load is going to be about half your body weight. Now if I played this out, by the third step you're going to see a big flattening out with the load. But that initial step, even with all that weight tugging on you, there's not much difference. And I did this with probably 15 athletes. So there's got to be something more to it. And so I'm thinking, wow. That, that's crazy. You'd think that, oh, I can't get out, big thing coming. So maybe sled running is great after that second step, but it's not going to have the impact that you have of getting out of that hole. Because I want that two tenths of a second. So this kind of takes us back into the, the wearables and kind of some other research on it. 
Internal force is generated by muscles pulling via their tendons, bones, and bone to bone, and bone forces exerted across joint surfaces. This is what's causing body segments to move. So again, this goes back to that twitch contraction stuff. It's not how much you can bench press, it's going to be how fast you can make things go. Where the external forces is going to be weightlifting, whether you're fighting gravity or something pushing you into the ground or trying to kill you. It's going to affect total body movement. So that is another thing that pushed me into these, these wearable things.